Children of God, thanks be to God. Very early on in human history, well, my historian father said history had to be written down, so human prehistory, we made a connection. We made a leap, and we made it around the world at one point. When we saw a plant, not this plant, but a plant, and we saw the things coming off the plant, and if we ate the things that came off the plant, then we kept going. And we discovered that if we keep the plant, if we keep as much of the plants together and we figure out how to keep the things coming off the plants, we can make it together. And the thing that, that decides what comes off the plant is the hot thing in the sky and the rain that comes from the sky. If the sun shines too bright, it burns the plant, and then the fruit doesn't grow on the plant, and then we're not going to make it. The sun doesn't shine enough, the plant withers, and we don't get the fruit from the plant, and we're not going to make it. If the rain, not enough rain, drought, and it dries out, no food, we're not going to make it. Too much rain, and it floats away. <laughs> Come back, plant. You combine that with our previous understanding of how we were hunters and gatherers before that. The hunts, they would go out and sometimes the hunt was so easy. It was like the animal gave itself over to be hunted. And there were other times you would go out and nothing. Half the population, we started this agricultural revolution and it started, human life started to be able to count things and, and we were started to be able to prepare for seasons and changes and times and half the population, just about, started realizing that their very bodies were connected to some 30 day cycle rotation and that's as articulate as I'm going to be. But all of these things were connected in some way outside of themselves that they had no control over. And they started using words like personality. Why did the rain fall sometimes and not other times? Why did the sun shine on their land and not my land? Why is my body affected this way and not yours? And so these forces outside of themselves, is it any wonder we as a collective started naming them as gods? That this personality, that this, the way we tried to understand why there were changes from one year to the next, this ends up becoming the very birth of religion. And out of that, there, you know, th there were some other things. Like one, how do I gain favor with the gods? Because there's real life and death reasons why I want favor. I need the plants to grow. I need my spouse to make it through childbearing. I need the animals to get caught for food. How do I gain favor? And there'd be, you know, arising out of that need, people who would tell you how you gain favor. And then there was, you would say that this is my God of the sun, or this is my, how I appease the gods. And you realize, you'd, you, after you were safe enough in your location, you realize that people in other locations well, they seem to have different gods. So religion was, how do you, religion started formulating this question of one, how do I gain favor? How is this regional? There's some kind of regional differences between my God and your God. And how do I, if I, how do I get there? How do I get my message to the gods? Which direction is the sun? Well, <laughs> during the day, up or down? It's up. Okay. The sun comes from up. Where does rain come from? Up. All right. Where are the gods? Uh, but 
When you die, where do you go? Where does your body go? All right, this is fundamentally where almost a wide spectrum of human experience in terms of our study of religion, proto-religions, the gods are up, the dead are down. This is what's called the three-tiered universe. It still lingers today. If I were to ask you, what direction is heaven? It's up. Which direction is hell? Whether or not you believe in one. It's down, right? Three-tiered universe, almost universally. Why are mountains so important to almost every world religion? Because they're up. They're high. Why, why is our, our buildings, in almost all ancient world religions, there's a story about buildings being built so tall that that, that somehow offends God. Why? Because they're trying to be like God. Because you're getting higher and higher. You have how you've reached your... Oh, 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 oh. So how do you get your message to those gods? Well, one, you can climb the mountain. Or you can send your official religious person to go up to the mountain and go talk to the gods and figure things out. Or two, how can you at home give the gods a gift? How can you take something here and get it up there? Burn it. You burn something and the smoke goes up. That's how we got burnt offerings. It's because things here then get to go up. All of this is like the starting points of so many world religions. And you can see how like ancient religions would say like, okay, so you had a good harvest. This is the portion of your harvest you now burn to give it back to the gods. Because maybe, just maybe, they'll be happy with that. I'm the expert on the gods and they have told us, uh, we have learned from experience that this much is how much you got to give. What about next year when you have a better harvest? Do you give the same amount as last year? Do you give a proportional increase? Because what happens if you displease the gods? You might not make it. We start reverting back. You see all these ancient religious fears? of pleasing the gods. Oh, 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 so you have figured it out. You actually have made it. You're actually finding some security in your crops and your religion and you have started to please the gods. And then there's some other group of people that moves in on your area and says, that's not how you please the gods. Well, I guess our gods are going up against your gods. In this cultural context, if this is the setting of proto-religions, in the midst of this kind of conversation, this story emerges. Do you see how this is a revolutionary religious step for how to understand God and the gods? Right? So... Here's Jacob. Is he worthy of the God's attention? Is there anything? Before here, last week, last week was such a nerve-wracking space because you got to hear how much of a jerk Jacob is. And I say that with all disrespect. And you didn't even get the next story. Jacob didn't just, like, get his firstborn birthright out of his brother, he then tricks his dad by putting on a very furry coat, his dad being blind, and is like, you can just imagine him doing a bad impersonation of his brother, lowering his voice and talking like, the, hey dad, can you give me that blessing that you've been meaning to give? Here, touch my hairy arm, you know it's me, Esau. Notably, I will say this, it wasn't his idea, his mom put him up to it. You can check your Bible. So he does this and has his brother gunning for him. He has nothing. 
He has no land. He has no value. He has no form. He has his father's blessing. And he has a stolen one done under false pretenses. And uh, a firstborn birthright that he got by cheating his brother out of it. What part of this shines as someone who should curry favor with the God? Nothing. Where is he? He's clearly on a holy place. He is at the designated spot for holiness and God to interact with places. When you reread that story, they don't tell you where he is until the very end. Why? Because it's trying to be a nowhere place. It says that Jacob came to a certain place. He didn't walk into the temple. He didn't walk onto holy ground. Quote, unquote. He's just on a hill and he ta- a place to take a nap. Well, he clearly performed the right ritual. He, he got ready. He got into the right state to have a dream. Have you ever tried to have a dream? Like pick out your dreams? They don't generally work. Especially when you have a stone for a pillow. Man... If, my, if the bed I sleep in isn't exactly right, I'm not going to sleep well anyway. This guy's got a stone for a pillow. And then it's the vision itself. Can you imagine people around the time hearing this story who aren't Jewish? Hold on here. You mean to say that somebody who isn't worthy One, has an audience with the holy. Second, the person who isn't worthy is spoken to. There is no confusion. There is no middle person between Jacob and God. There's no priest. There's no cleric. There's no shaman. There is just Jacob and God. And God speaks speaks directly to this one and says, not I'm going to mess you up, not I'm going to come after you for all the bad things you've done, not I'm going to stomp you where you find yourself, not even, well, good luck. It's I have a plan for you. No matter what you've done, there is still a future where my, my life is entwined with yours. You are going to make it because I am with you. Not because of the animals that you sacrifice. Not because of the line you're from or the family or the location you're a part of. Or the tribe you claim is yours. But because I claim you as mine. There is no call. Can you see how this is a revolutionary step forward for anyone living at the time? And then these are like touch points for, for, for everybody who would come after Jacob. And like the rest of some of the Hebrew Bible is kind of this conversation. You, you can see it when, <laughs> when Moses is saying, okay, everybody who's at the base of Sinai, what's Sinai? A mountain. And where's God on the mountain? up. And Moses says, hey, 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 you know, God wants to give us the commandments. We're gonna, I'm just going to make sure God talks to all of you. What do the people say? No! <laughs> we don't want that. This, the, the rest of, for the rest of the Hebrew Bible, you see this, it's not a one and done. It's not God has made this declaration statement to God's people. It's God, it, it's the people rebelling again and again saying, you know what, I think, I, I think I understand religion better if there's a middle person between me and God. You know, I think I understand religion better. I think I can understand God better if it's culturally specific to just me and not them. If my God and my understanding of God is actually in conflict with them, I understand it better. That makes more sense. If I, can, if I can do things to curry favor with my God, that makes things so much easier to understand. If we can have rites and rituals whereby I can sacrifice and then God loves me, that makes so much more sense to me. Yes, the Old Testament. That, that, it's just so old and out of date. It has no lessons for us today. 
in the fullness of time, one of Jacob's descendants. As a Christian, I call it the fullness of time. One of Jacob's descendants enfleshed every principle that was described as God's promise to Jacob, made it as a living, walking, breathing human being. That promise made flesh. Jesus of Nazareth, when he walked around, when, 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 when the religious folks of his day said to him, you know, there's a holy place to worship God. God is in the temple. Jesus said, tear down the temple. I'll rebuild it in three days. When, G, when they said to him, you know, on the mountain where the temple resides, that's where people will gather. Jesus said, there comes a day when on every mountain and every people will not worship God in mountains and in buildings, but in spirit and truth. Man, regional loyalty, your brand of Judaism or worshiping God, Jesus showed no regard. The Roman centurion, Jesus healed his son. In fact, he said, no greater faith has anyone in Israel than this Roman centurion, a villain if anyone in his day would have saw him as one. The Canaanite woman who comes to him begging, and he's like, he, he even kind of falls into that little bit of a trap saying, you know, I came for the, I came for the children, and it's not okay to give food to dogs, what was meant for the children. And the Canaanite woman says to him, even the dogs eat the scraps from the master's table. And Jesus clicks back in. You're totally right. You're absolutely right. The Samaritan woman, who Samaritans... And Judeans, I mean, that the history of the conflict between those two, let alone the fact that Jesus is this male rabbi just crossing borders to talk to her, not just about day-to-day -day things, but giving her revelation about water that will well up within her. That's to say nothing about like trying to curry favor with the gods. Jesus has literally no time for that. It starts, I mean, it <laughs> starts with his birth, his mom. You have a 13-year-old girl from the middle of nowhere. She's going to bring about the savior of the world. Zacchaeus, a tax collector, not just a traitor to his people, but a charlatan. This is the person he wants to eat dinner with. The prodigal son, the stories he tells about the, lo the lost sheep. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love. God loves you abundantly, aboundedly, without caution, regret. There is no turning back. You are worthy just as you are. There is no need for the burnt sacrifice. Whether it's the thief on the cross to the feeding of the 5,000, the people who share Jesus' company, not one of them is worthy, but Jesus does not regard their presence in his life as, as a burden or as something dependent on smooth circumstance. Jesus pours out this abundant, generous, loving life towards anyone everywhere and forever. So, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, that settled it for us, right? We, we didn't fall into the same trap that like the rest of the Hebrew Bible did. We don't have any subscription to God is only found in one location. God is only subject to one kind of religion or faith. And we definitely never try to curry favor with God, right? Because we all believe that all of that was settled by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Well, it gets a little rough, right? I could easily, 
easily talk about Christian's tendency for the idolatry of our buildings, of our sacred spaces. That's to say nothing about how beautiful, wonderful, uh, architectural, and historic so many of our buildings are. Some of you have been to Europe. I've seen the pictures. This space, the fact that we're burning a mortgage in a couple of weeks, man, this, it's easy to turn these places because we have poured so much of our heart, soul, our discipleship into them. But it's so much bigger than just like Christian sense of their church buildings. I know this. Last year I had to, because both of my parents had passed, my dad died, oh no, not last, oh geez, time just goes by. In uh, the summer of 2020, I had to sell my parents' house because my dad had died in January. This was the house that I grew up in, the house that was always the safe landing place through my whole growing up. And my dad and my mom, God bless them, love them. There's, this is not a critique, right? I don't hold anything against them, but they didn't do anything to update their house in like 15 years. And they both smoked heavily. And so selling that house was an adventure. <laughs> On top of the emotional crippling weight of like, this is my home. This is safe. And I got to sell, I had to clean it out, get it ready to sell. And I met the guy who bought the house, guy a little older than me, <laughs> threw me for a loop. And I'm seeing the empty house and I am filled with dread and sadness because I'm like, mom passed away over there, dad passed away over there. We like, and, and look at how this is not what it should be. The, the yellowing of the paint, the smoke, the... And I'm standing next to the guy buying the house and he's just, my kids are gonna be playing over there. We're gonna knock down this wall. We're gonna build this new thing over here. And he is just beaming. It, like he's just filled with visions of what's gonna be. His kids are little, his little girls are, he's like, I just can't wait. We're gonna use this space for, for this is where the prom pictures are gonna be. And then my first reaction was, shut up. <laughs> Don't you know? Don't you understand how sad I am? But he doesn't. He shouldn't. I'm not going to, why should, this got, it's more beautiful that way. Because then the, well, it's not mine, this location. That's the thing about it. It's not mine. This was where I became the man I am today, but nothing, all this, this whole journey of my life that I've been on has been a gift from God. And I'm just gracious, grateful that the gift that was that house gets to be a gift to someone else. Can you hold that for this space? I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads because many of you have been in the place where I was, where that was your home. Can you say that about your church? Can you say that about your denomination? Can you say that about your conference, about your organizations that you're a part of, that this was a gift handed to you for you to steward for a time and then to hand off? So that's location, culturally. <laughs> Spirit of hope. You have been ahead of so much when it comes to United Methodism in Minnesota, social impact. Will you keep the door open in this new phase of Christian faith that we call post-COVID era or, you know, continued COVID era? What will Christian faith look like in the days ahead? Will we rush back and hold on to only our brand, to only our understanding, to only our closing off every door and window? Or do we keep it open? One challenge I always put to church leaders, I tell this to every church leader, like, what happens if 15 young families 
show up for Sunday. They decide they're going to be big givers, both financially and of their hours. There isn't a leader in here who doesn't go, oh, thank God. <sighs> but with every blessing, you get 15 families, and what if they all have ideas about how the church should look, feel, sound? What's your favorite thing about church? What if they want to change that? It's just one of those things to hold. I'm not saying that's happening. But it's one of those internal checks about regional understandings of God. When you interact with someone who believes differently than you, when their expression of Christian faith is so much different than yours, do you greet it with a generous nature? Or do you close that door and say dreams are just dreams? I would hope that I wouldn't have to go on about having to curry favor with God, but it still happens. It happens a little less than it used to. This is one of the classic examples as pastor man. I miss somebody from a couple of Sundays, and they come up to me. Pastor, let me tell you why I missed last Sunday. You know, I was just, it was a long week and, 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 and Sunday's like my second day off, but like Saturday was filled and I just couldn't make it to church. And it, it gets a little awkward because they're like pouring out like, I'm not here to absolve you of your sin, man. Like, <laughs> this is not, like I've got some cosmic clipboard where I take attendance. Make sure you're here on Sunday. And if you don't make it, enough times in a year, you know, I can't speak for eternity, but your chances aren't looking good. You know where that comes from? For some of us, a good place, because if you've been here long enough, you have friends who have been looking for you. And that's actually one of the things you're reaching for as a church. If this is one of your first five Sundays, the hope is, is that eventually you're missed when you're not here. But for some folks, what's birthed in them, if they miss, is this deep sense that I don't know if I'm going to be okay if I come back. There's so many folks post-COVID who haven't come back, who haven't come back for a Sunday. And I'm not just talking Spirit of Hope. I'm talking just every church. My wife went down to the largest Methodist church in the United States, uh, Church of the Resurrection. They're still 30% down on Sunday attendance. And they got all the bells and whistles. They got everything a church would want. And they're 30% down. I can't help but believe that some of that is due to, if I go back, I don't know. How am I going to feel? Maybe, I'm, maybe I don't fit in anymore. And this, sisters and brothers... This is where our story really takes it. Do you think Jacob would have got there with reason? Do you think a strategic plan would have taught Jacob that there was a God that reaches down out of heaven, no respecter of regional areas? It says that that ladder, that the messengers were coming up and down, not just to him, but to everybody. Do you, that, that, can't, that, that this God that spoke to him, it didn't just come through well-written work. It wasn't just spoken through. Uh, uh, his ch being chosen wasn't done through an equation of righteous works versus unrighteous activity. God reached Jacob with a dream. Now, I'm, I've, I'm pretty vocal about my skepticism of dreams. But what does it take to imagine something new? What would it take for you to imagine something new? For Spirit of Hope, for Minnesota Annual Conference, for the United Methodist Church, for your family, for your children, your grandchildren. Maybe we need a few more dreamers. Will you dream with me in the coming weeks, months, and years? Amen.